Hey, Revelstoke Alliance Church. Uh, this is a sermon for those of you who were not able to make it to yesterday's service, Sunday service. So, this is a different kind of sermon. It's a summary on our process so far as a church as we wrestle with the biblical question about women being elders at Revelstoke Alliance Church. So, as a congregation, we have embarked on a journey to examine what the Bible says about the structure and role of leadership in the church. Specifically, we're considering uh, two questions. The first question, does the Bible restrict the role of elder to men only, or does it permit us to change our bylaws to include women as elders? And then the second question is, number two, if the Bible does permit us to change our bylaws to remove the gender distinction on who can serve as an elder, uh, then the next question is, should we? Should we do that? If the Bible permits us to do that, should we do that as a church? So in order to really dig into what the Bible does and doesn't say about this issue, we've been working through quite a lot of material together. We have printed out a 60-page theological reader of various theological articles showing different viewpoints and understandings of the issue. Uh, we brought in some books and added them to our library, uh, we bought a book called Paul and Gender by Cynthia Westfall, who is the professor of New Testament studies at McMaster University in Hamilton in Ontario. And then we brought in another book called Two Views on Women in Ministry, which gives four different essays from different biblical scholars on the issues and scriptures involved in this debate. And then as a church, we have gone through three lectures for a total of about eight hours of teaching, discussion, and exercises by Dr. Ken Redant, uh, Associate Professor of Theology at Kerry Theological College in Vancouver. We got those lectures from uh, Mission Creek Alliance Church in Kelowna. We really appreciate all the work that that church put into um, progressing through this issue. We have been piggybacking a lot on their material. Special thank you and shout out to Pastor Keith there. Appreciate all the work that we have benefited from. And then in addition to all that, uh, my own five-part sermon series on this issue from 2021 was uploaded for everyone to listen to on our website. Now you can go to our website and check that out if that is something of interest. Now what I want to try and do today is to do an impossible task and summarize in the next 20-30 minutes uh, the main points of Dr. Redancy's lectures and then finish with just one of the reasons from Scripture why I think we certainly can have women as elders here at Revelstoke Alliance Church. So those eight hours of lectures, I'm just going to try and hit some of the high points, a uh, very condensed version. Um, so here we go. Lecture number one from Professor Redant was about how to read and understand the Bible and also how to identify essential and non-essential matters in the Bible, matters of theology, that is. So in this lecture, uh, Dr. Redan explained that all written communication can be read and received in different ways, that we bring to uh, any written communication our own previous understandings and our own views. Um, it's true of whatever written thing we read, whether that's a book or a newspaper, a magazine article, an email, we know that communication can be quite challenging. We've all misread an email, perhaps, and attributed a different set of emotions than what the writer actually had. We, if we don't know the context and the background, it's easy to misunderstand some written communication. So uh, we bring that to every single piece of writing that we read, including the Bible. So in order to find common ground in how we all approach the Bible, there are some basic rules for reading scripture that all evangelical Christian churches agree on and follow. So this is how an evangelical Christian church approaches scripture, approaches the Bible. And these are sort of high level points that we all agree on. So we're all talking about and approaching the Bible the same way. So uh, what are those points? Well, we agree that the Bible is inspired that means the Spirit of God has guided what was written so that it was the results that God wanted. The word inspired literally means God-breathed. It was God-breathed, God-inspired uh, 
breathed into the words that were written in the scripture. So they're from God. And therefore, they are authoritative. The Bible is the guide and standard for Christian faith and practice. We don't get to make up what we think church should look like. We follow what the Bible says church needs to look like. Um, the Bible, we also recognize, is both divine and human. Uh, in that God communicates through thoughts and words of human authors. And that God is guiding and not bypassing their thought process and their intentions. So it's a combination of God inspiring humans to write. So there is a human aspect to the Bible. That's why, for example, we have the gospel according to Mark and the gospel according to Matthew and Luke and John. They're all the gospel. They're all God's word, but they all come through this personality of the writer. And therefore, the Bible uses normal human language. Normal human language interpreted the way we read other comparable literature. So, normal human language. And the Bible is set in history. It's written in the language and to the culture and circumstances by the by the intent so the circumstances intended by the author so it's set in history it's written in a particular language in a particular time to a particular group of people um, and it was intended to say something by the author number six uh, it is written to an anticipated historical audience so it the, that means the way we approach scripture is it was written for us but it was not written to us. It was written to a church in Rome or Ephesus or Corinth or, or Philippi all these years ago, thousands of years ago. So the way we approach the Bible is we try and find out what it meant to the people receiving those letters and scriptures. And then from what it meant to them, we draw out an application of what it means to us today. And also that it is spirit illuminated. The spirit, the Holy Spirit worked works through and with study of the scripture. So we study the scripture, the Holy Spirit comes in and illuminates what it means. Studying the scripture and thinking through the scripture is not unspiritual. In fact, it's very spiritual. It's uh, the Holy Spirit doing that through us. So studying scripture is a good thing. So I'll just repeat those again. Uh, the scripture is inspired, authoritative. It's a combination of divine and human it uses normal human language, it is set in history, written to an anticipated historical audience, and spirit illuminated as we study it. So in this case, we are attempting to make a decision on how we structure the leadership of our church in a biblical way, since the Bible is authoritative and inspired. And we recognize that in understanding how the Bible applies to us today, uh, as we wrestle with the language and context of another historical era. So the Bible was written in this other historical era in a different language, and we are wrestling with how that applies to us today. So what were Dr. Redant's guidelines for best reading the Bible and to help us sort through what is an essential biblical doctrine, which is core to our faith, and what is an important yet non-essential doctrine, so important, but secondary to our faith. So how do we decide which of the doctrines in the Bible are core and which there is no room for debate on if you want to claim yourself to be a Christian? And on which doctrines in the Bible do we say are secondary or non-essential and which there is quite some debate and you can still be a Christian and hold different views on? Well, uh, in order to do that, we have to sort of do a few things. We have to understand and examine the basic building blocks, the words and the grammar. We go back to the grammatical structures of the Greek and the Hebrew, the specific words of the Greek and the Hebrew, and try and understand the words that God chose to use and to communicate to us through that filter back then. And then we always read in context. So we don't just pull a verse out and say, look, that's what that means. That's what the Bible says. We take a verse and then we look at the context of the verses around them. And then we look at the context of the chapter. And then we look at the context of the book that it's found in. We look at the context of the whole scripture. And then we also look at the historical context. What was happening in the world at the time that that book was written? And, and who wrote it? And why were they writing it? And to whom did they write it? What was the purpose? We look at the context. 
Then we also consider how the genre might affect the message. You can't read a poem the same way you read a set of laws. And yet we find both those genres of writing in scripture. So you should read a set of laws one way and you should read poetry and love songs a completely different way. It'd be terrible if you reread both those things the same way. Uh, kind of defeats the purpose. So when we say we take the Bible, you know, all of the Bible, it does mean we interact with the different genres in different ways. And then we should ask ourselves, what question is the author trying to answer in this passage? What answers are given? Sometimes we're not sure what the question is that is being asked and answered. So that's a good way to process. What does this mean? Well, the one question to ask is, what was the question that the author was answering? Then test your interpretation by how well it makes sense of the flow of thought, of that thought that's being expressed, of that passage of scripture. Does your interpretation of that verse, of that word, make sense within the bigger flow of thought? Uh, study what the whole Bible says on a particular theme. Very important so you can see how that particular passage fits in overall. And then lastly, study in community, drawing on the gifts and the insights of everyone. Everyone in your church and your Bible study group have different experiences of different levels of background and have studied different things. And so they give different perspectives on how these things might apply. If you have a musician and an engineer in your Bible study group or in your church, it's guaranteed just from their education and their interests and their thought processes that they're going to come at Scripture in different ways. And so studying community, you'll see different facets of Scripture. Now, these ideas and these thoughts and this way of reading Scripture, I've tried to include in my sermons over the years, so hopefully you as a church uh, we'll recognize some of these concepts and it'll not be new to you. So that was the first lecture, how to read the Bible, how to approach the Bible, how to discern between essential and non-essential matters. Second lecture from Dr. Redant was entitled Eldership and Women in the Bible. Now in this lecture, Dr. Redant took a wide look at what the Bible says an elder is and what an elder does. He suggested that the words for overseer, elder, pastor, deacon have all quite a bit of overlap in the New Testament. Uh, they could be describing the same leadership role within the New Testament church, just with different nuances to the various responsibilities, or he might be, uh, the, it could be describing different roles within the church. He went on to discuss just what exactly the Bible means by words like authority and leadership and teaching and and does somebody who's doing the teaching somehow inherently have authority because the teaching carries authority? So there's lots of things to see who has authority to make decisions, what leadership looks like, who gets to teach, etc., etc. He made some excellent points that the churches throughout history, including up until today, have more or less taken one of three approaches to church governance and structure. There are those churches where leaders are appointed. So a leader will appoint another leader, and those leaders will make decisions for the church. Um, those are called Episcopal-led churches. You think about like the Church of England, like the Anglican Church, like the Roman Catholic Church, where leaders are appointed, cardinals, bishops, archbishops, priests appointed. Then we have those churches where the congregation votes on everything. And the congregation as a whole makes decisions for the church. Congregational churches, sometimes Mennonite churches, Baptist churches, um, the, the Quakers, for example. Different churches approach that a uh, different way. Congregationalist churches. And then we have churches where the congregation elects leaders to represent them and make decisions on their behalf. That's a Presbyterian. That word Presbyterian means literally means an elder. Um, in English, presbytos. So that's a Presbyterian or an elder-led church. you got the Church of Scotland, and you have the uh, many of the Baptist churches. Uh, the Alliance Church is a Presbyterian church structure, so elder-led church. Now, what was really interesting in Dr. Redan's lecture was that he said all three of those processes, the leaders appointing other leaders, congregations voting as a whole, and congregations electing elders— 
can all be found in the New Testament. All three of these models can be found in the New Testament. You see, in the New Testament, as the church grows and moves and morphs throughout the book of Acts, we see the structure of the church grow and move and morph in response. So all three models have biblical New Testament precedents. Different churches are structured in different ways, both in the Bible and in current times. All three classic approaches claim New Testament support for the church organization. The hierarchical, um, ecclesiastical, oh, it's the word Episcopalian model. You've got scriptures in Matthew 16, Acts 6, 14, Timothy and Titus. Congregational model, you've got Luke 22, John 13, Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 1. And then Presbyterian, you have Acts 13, Acts 15, Acts 1, Acts 6. So you have different models as the church wrestles and responds to different circumstances in its life. So as part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance denomination, as I said, we are Presbyterian in our structure, elder-led. The members of each church elect elders to lead and make decisions on their behalf. Now, the Bible does not say all that much about the specifics of how churches were structured or the specific details of the roles that an elder took on in biblical times. We do not have a biblical job description of the role of an elder. What we do have in First and Second Timothy and in Titus are descriptions about the type of people the elders should be, the character traits of an elder. So no detailed description on what exactly elders, pastors, overseers, and deacons did, where the overlap was with all those things, but lots of types, lots of scriptures about what type of people they should be. So that's an interesting thing. We don't have a job description, and so we're maybe free a little bit to structure our church and divvy up the ministry responsibilities to uh, according to the needs of our own church. Then uh, Dr. Redant went on to give an overview of women's roles in the Bible. He acknowledged that the Bible was written during a patriarchal culture. And then he asked the question, a very interesting question, is this culture something that the Bible prescribes and requires, or is the Bible describing the culture as it was and working out how to follow God, how a follower of God should live within that kind of culture? So is the culture the Bible describes something the Bible says the way it should be, or is it simply describing what is and then giving instructions on how to be that kind of person within that structure? It's a very good question. And then he went on to list uh, the many exceptions to the patriarchal culture of leadership where women played important leadership roles in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. Miriam, uh, that's Moses' sister, and she was a prophetess and helped lead Israel uh, out of Egypt. Deborah, Dorcas, Lydia, Priscilla, and Junius, just a few examples from Old and New Testament. So, although it's a patriarchal culture, there are many women leaders in Scripture. The third lecture was key Bible passages. Key Bible passages. So, with all of that being said, that context of how to approach Scripture and then having a look at church structure in the Bible and women's roles in the Bible, uh, we approach four different groups of key passages in the Scripture that will help us determine how to uh, vote, and how to move forward with this question as a church. These passages are at the center of the debate of how church leadership is to be structured, and also a broader thought about the roles and relationships between men and women. He encouraged us to consider the tools for reading scripture in lecture one and the background for church leadership in lecture two, and to consider the following four groups of scriptures in lecture three. So the first group of scripture to consider in this debate, this issue, is the creation and fall passages. So basically Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. And there it shows that Adam and Eve were created equally in value uh, and their roles and functions are, depending on how you read it, perhaps there is a hierarchy of Adam and then Eve, a hierarchy of leadership, within the relationship between Adam and Eve. So depending on how you read Genesis 1, 
chapters 1, 2, and 3, you will see as Adam and Eve being created fully equal and co-responsible for being God's representatives on earth, or you see Adam being created first and Eve being created as a secondary helper to help Adam achieve what God had asked Adam to do. Different ways of reading it that will set the tone for the reading of the rest of Scripture. So Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. And then the results of the fall into sin and the breakdown of relationship between Adam and Eve and between them as a couple and God, between them as a couple in the environment, and what was a result of that fall either before or after sin entered into the world. So you have the creation and fall passages. Then the second group of scriptures to consider are what Pastor Redan, uh, Professor Redan called the equality texts. The texts, particularly in the New Testament, emphasize equality, gifts of the Spirit given to everyone, all people to be involved in God's work equally. The Spirit is given to every single one of us. We see that in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Your young men shall dream dreams and your, your young women shall prophesy and all the things where the Spirit is given to everyone equally. And if we are to do the work of the body of Christ, everyone is to be able to use the gifts that God has given them to build up the body of Christ. Equality texts. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14. And then we see it particularly again in Galatians chapter 3 where uh, Paul wrote that we are all one in Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. That's the racial element. There is no longer, you know, sort of slave or free. That's the social element. And there's no longer male or female. That's the gender element. So does that mean that simply that everyone can come to Jesus and be saved? Or does that mean that within the structure and relationships amongst each other, those division markers should no longer be div dividing and therefore permitting, uh, maybe even encouraging us to vote yes for women as elders in our church. The equality text, everyone receives the Holy Spirit, everyone is gifted, we're all meant to build up the church. Now, it's not the only kind of texts that are in the Bible. We also have what Professor Redant called prohibition texts, where Paul prohibits certain activities in the church along gender lines. Questions to consider. Uh, why did he prohibit certain things? What was the questions that Paul was answering? What precisely was he prohibiting? Who was prohibited from doing what? How do these prohibitions speak to the question of women as elders? And so you'll find two prohibition texts in Scripture. You'll find one in 1 Corinthians 14 and one in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 15. Undoubtedly, Paul is prohibiting the women from doing certain things. The question is why and what exactly is he prohibiting? And does this speak to uh, the role of women as elders? And so these are questions that are challenging and interesting. And we need to work through those passages in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Timothy and let them speak to us as God's inspired word. We're not trying to get out from under them. They're God's inspired word, they're God's authoritative word, just as the equality texts are, so we need to hear all of them. And then we have the last group of uh, scriptures that Professor Redan talked about, the headship texts. The Bible says that the husband is the head of the wife. Uh, and what does that mean exactly? Um, it's all about, it's not so much about what, those kind of scriptures are not so much about what men and women can and cannot do, but instead it definitely speaks to the relationship between genders in the Bible. What does it mean when the Bible says the husband is the head of the wife? Is this about relationship? Is it about authority? Is it about provision? The husband is to provide for his wife. He is the head of the provision. Is it about the creation order? Is that what it's about there? Adam was created and then put to sleep and out of Adam's body, God took a rib and fashioned Eve. And so literally Adam's body was the source for Eve's body. And so the first woman was born out of Adam's body, out of a male body. And then every person after that was born out of the woman's body. This mutuality 
So is it talking about provision and creation? Is it talking about serving? When we hear the word head in English, it means to us, our first thought is probably like the head of a company and then the assistant or, or whatever. So it's a hierarchical thing. But if you think about, for example, the head of a river, the source of a river, it's nothing to do with hierarchy. It's to do with where the river originated from. So if Adam is regarded as the head of humanity and Eve came out of Adam, is it referring to that? Or is it referring to this authoritative, hierarchical, who has authority to lead and decide and make decisions? There's different ways of approaching the same scriptures. And we find those in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 through 16, and Ephesians 5, verses 21 to 33. And then also, how do these passages inform our vote on women as elders? So as you can already tell, before you even go do some digging deep into those passages, that it creates some tension. On one hand, you have passages about universal gifting and participation. And on the other hand, you have passages about differentiation and submission and limitations. And this is a place where we have tension in Scripture from different themes, and we have to try and find a way to fit them all together in a cohesive way. Now, Dr. Radan in his lectures asked us to consider three questions. The questions are, uh, do you see evidence that the Bible teaches a universal male leadership principle? Yes or no? If yes, why? If no, why? Do you see that the Bible teaches some form of general headship principle for men and or husbands? And then, do you see these scriptures being situational or universal, particularly the prohibitions? Were the prohibitions for those particular situations in those particular churches or are they universal for all churches for all time? So, uh, if you want to know my view, universal male leadership principle, no. Some form of general headship principle for men and husbands, yes, but I see that as provision uh, that the husband should provide for and serve and look after uh, and contribute to their wives, not as a hierarchical decision. And then situation or universal prohibitions, I believe they're situational. And so uh, here's the reason why I believe they're situational. I'm going to pick three scriptures uh, passages of scriptures, one from First Timothy, where it's a very direct prohibition from Paul to the role of women in that church. Then in First Corinthians, I'm going to look at what seems to be a partial prohibition to what some of the women could do some of the time in Corinth. And then I'm going to look at Romans, where the women were leaders in the church and leading much of what was happening. So we have First Corinthians, sorry, First Timothy two. Verses 11 and 12. 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Pretty direct verse. Um, challenging for us to hear in 2023. But God's word, God's inspired word, God's authoritative word. So we take it on board. And we listen to it and let it speak to us and direct us. Then 1 Corinthians 14, uh, a few different verses in there. If anyone should speak in a tongue, two or at the most, by three should speak one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. And if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Wow, that's an even harsher statement. However, two chapters before, Paul says when a woman does pray and prophesy in a church, she has to have her head covered in order to do so. We don't really understand the cultural implications, the historical implications of that. But what we do have is Paul saying, when anyone speaks or prophesies, then it has to look a certain way. And when a woman prays and prophesies, it has to look a certain way. 
But also he's got this, women should remain silent in the churches. Now we can't forget a couple of things. First of all, being a patriarchal society, women at that time, 2,000 years ago, were not allowed to go to school. They had no education whatsoever. And so is Paul making this blanket ban along gender lines or is he making it along education lines? The only the ones who can read the scripture and who have been to school can speak to the truth of the scripture. Um, that could well be. I mean, it's still that case in some parts of the world where the girls don't get to go to school at all or have a very limited education. And that's how it was in the Roman Empire. Now, that being said, so we have the uh, sort of blanket prohibition in First Timothy. We've got the partial prohibition in Corinthians. Then we get to the book of Romans, chapter 16, last chapter. Paul says, I, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at, at Kencheria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people, including myself. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me, not only I, but for all the churches that the Gentiles are grateful for them. Greet also the church that meets in their house. Greet my dear friends Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews, who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. And then Paul continues on to greet various leaders. Ten of the 29 leaders of the Roman church were women. Now, I just want to point a couple of things out here. We have Phoebe, who is a deacon. That is an official role within the church. A minister is what we would describe it as maybe now. Phoebe was a minister in the church. To what extent and how does that play with eldership? That's questionable, but she was definitely a leader in the church. Then we have Priscilla and Aquila, this husband and wife team. We see them pop up in the Bible a whole bunch in, in uh, teaching and preaching and hosting churches. What's very, very interesting, in addition to them leading the church, Priscilla's name comes first and then Aquila. In the Roman Empire times, it would be unheard of. It would always be the man first, who's the head of the house, then the women. But here we have Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla getting kind of the lead um, billing in this couple. But then we have something very, very interesting. Greet Andronicus, that's a man, and Junia, that's a woman, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding amongst the apostles. <coughs> Andronicus and Junia were apostles. We have a woman apostle right in the book of Romans. So an apostle was somebody who planted a church, who was a missionary, who went out and preached God's word, who did God's work. Junia, an apostle outstanding amongst the apostles, really leading the church. So as I said, 10 out of the 29 church leaders greeted in the book of Rome, Romans were women. So how can we hold all these three things together? There's tension in there. We have a blanket prohibition in 1 Timothy. I forbid a woman to have authority over a man. We have partial prohibition in 1 Corinthians. When a woman prays or, or prophesies, she has to have a head covering. And then we have straight up affirmation of women leaders in the book of Romans. Greet, greet Junia, outstanding amongst the apostles. Greet Phoebe, a deacon. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. The church meets in their home. So, we have a blanket prohibition, a partial prohibition, and a full affirmation. How can all three of these things be true at the same time? How can all three of these scripture passages be God-breathed and authoritative at the same time? Now, the only way that I can reconcile them is if they are individual church situations in Ephesus, Corinth, and Rome. Paul, don't forget, is a pragmatist and a missionary. He himself relates to different groups of people differently in different situations in order that the gospel can be heard. It's exactly what he said about his ministry approach in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through to 23. He says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews, to 
to those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am uh, under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak, I become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. So Paul is the ultimate pragmatist when it comes to ministry structure in order that the gospel can be heard. And that would explain why, perhaps, there's three different approaches to those three different churches in Ephesus, Corinth, and Rome. We saw this, for example, in the book of Acts, where on one hand, he had Timothy circumcised so that no offense would be given to the Jews when they preached the gospel. But on the other hand, he quoted Greek poets and philosophers to gain the ear of the Greek audience in order to present to them the good news of the gospel. So, distilling it all down, are the women in the church in Ephesus, as Paul is writing to Timothy, and Timothy is the pastor in Ephesus, are the women in the church in Ephesus being restricted in some way in the public gathering of the church? The answer is yes, they are. Are the women in the church in Corinth somewhat restricted with the head coverings somehow in the church in Corinth? Yes, they are. They are partially restricted. And are the women in the church in Rome leaders and deacons and teachers and hosting the church and an apostle? Yes, they are. So for those and many other scriptural reasons, that is why I am personally going to vote yes to the question of Rebel Stoke Alliance Church having women as elders. But again, my vote is only one vote out of all the members of the church. And so when we gather to have this vote, um, I don't get to decide this. We get to decide it as a church. Now, if you have not yet engaged with all of these resources, the books, the articles, the sermons, the lectures, uh, please do so. In our next two prayer times in our Sunday service, we're going to set them aside specifically to pray through these issues as a whole church, asking for wisdom and insight. Uh, and so that's the end of my summation of the lectures from Dr. Ken Radance. If you who are watching this have any other questions about the scriptures, about the process, about anything at all, uh, please just send me an email um, and I will reply to you and if you are okay with it i also post the reply up on our physical notice board within the church in the foyer so that other people can read the questions that are being asked and read the answers that are being given and we continue as we continue to wrestle with this subject we'll be taking the actual vote either in march or in april we still have to decide that nail that down uh, as an elders board as soon as we have a definite date i will let you know all right Thank you for considering this. Um, it's a very important matter for us as a church, how we move forward, how we structure a church, who is leading, what voices um, are making these decisions on behalf of us as a congregation. So please consider it carefully because we do want to be biblical about how we do these things. I will see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.